Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and welcome to my September wrap up. Today I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the month of September. So I read nine things in the month of September um, and let me tell you about them today. I sort of half tried to do Shorty September um, in September but I didn't do very well there. I think I read three things that were very short and would count for Shorty September but the other six things I read were quite long. Um, I'm also halfway through two books um, that I didn't manage to finish off in September that I'm going to be carrying on over into the next month so I'll talk about them as well. But let's start off as I often do in these videos with some classics. Um, so I I reread Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens in September. I actually started this in August um, but I finished it off in September. I've been listening to the audiobook narrated by Mira Seal which was great and um, I've listened to that audiobook before. I've read this book many times. I think this was, I don't know, the eighth time I've read it maybe could be more. Um, this is my favourite book ever and it's a book with many plot lines um, and many characters as you might be able to guess from the size of it but all the characters are kind of pulled together by the theme of money and by the River Thames. So there is a massive fortune that has been made in rubbish um, has been made in dust and when the man who has made this fortune dies and he leaves his money to his son on the condition that his son marries a particular woman but his son um, is found drowned on his journey home to England and everything kind of goes on from there. We see what happens to this fortune and how it affects various different characters who are kind of connected by this incident um, and it's just a wonderful wonderful novel. There is so much I love about this. Um, I will be making a separate video about this and um, because I read this for the Mega Dickens read along, a two-year read along that is like almost over um, which is wild to think. I am a month behind um, so some people have now finished reading all of Dickens um, but I have got a little bit behind so I need to finish off The Mystery of Edwin Drood in October and then I will be done um, and I will have read yeah all of Dickens's novels in chronological order which has been really fun. So I go on for too long about this book here. I just think it is incredible. There's so much that I love about it. Um, the plot, the characters, the themes, um, there are so many individual characters and moments that I just adore um, and I just had a lovely time rereading this. And then I also read a Victorian short story this month, um, partly for Shorty September, um, and that was My Friend the Murderer by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, which is a short story from 1882, which I thought sounded interesting. Um, I've read a lot of Sherlock Holmes, but I haven't read that much else by Arthur Conan Doyle, um, and I came across this one and I thought it would be interesting to read. Um, and this is basically a story about um, a man who is a prison doctor, and he ends up kind of speaking to and learning more about um, a man who is in prison for murder. Um, and this this kind of story looks at that dynamic um, and the man's life. I thought this was quite an interesting story. It wasn't that long and it wasn't as fun, I would say, as some of the Sherlock Holmes stories, um, but it was still very interesting to read. And then before I move away from the Victorians, um, the two books that I am partway through are also Victorian, so I thought I would just mention them earlier on in this video. So I'm about a third of the way through um, The Mystery of Edwin Drood by Charles Dickens, which is Charles Dickens's last unfinished novel that he was halfway through writing when he died. I'm listening to the audiobook narrated by Billy Howell, and this is meant to be September pick for the Mega Dickens read along um, and I just didn't quite manage to finish it off in September but I am really enjoying it so far, finding it really fascinating um, and I'm sure I will finish it off early on in October and you know it's a Victorian book so I don't mind carrying it over into October. Um, I have read this before but not for about 13 years and um, so it's really nice to reread and rediscover it. It's such a great story, it's so sad that Dickens didn't manage to finish it. This novel is basically the story um, of various characters in a cathedral town and what happens when a young man called Edwin Drood disappears. Um, hence why it's called The Mystery of Edwin Drood but it is a very great mystery because Charles Dickens didn't manage to finish off writing it and died when he was literally halfway through the book. It is very good and I'm really enjoying it so far. And then I'm also about a third of the way through Ayala's Angel by Anthony Trollope um, which I actually started reading back in August but I've just been like reading it here and there around other things um, and because it's a Victorian book and I don't mind carrying it over into October I sort of didn't end up prioritising it in September as much as maybe I would have liked to because I am hugely hugely enjoying it and I'm hoping to finish it off very early in October. It's now like my main read and I'm getting through it a bit faster. So Ayala's Angel is about two sisters Ayala and Lucy and after their parents death um, they are kind of taken in 
by their aunts and uncles but they end up being separated one um sent to live with one family and one sent to live with the other family and we're basically following lucy and isla's um various kind of friendships and romantic relationships and the title kind of refers to the fact that isla um has this kind of angelic vision in her head of the kind of man she wants to fall in love with the kind of man that she wants to marry i'm just over a third of the way through now absolutely loving it um, and hopefully i'll finish this off very early in october it is fantastic so far so moving away from the victorians and moving on to things that i actually managed to finish in september next i want to talk about this this is noli me tangere um which means touch me not um and this is a novel from the philippines by jose rizal um from 1887 and this was fantastic so this is a truly truly wonderful novel that I kind of just think everyone should read. It was so good. Um, possibly my favourite classic I've read this year so far. I just thought it was fantastic and really powerful and epic and amazing um, and the social critique and the characterization and the plot and everything it's just fantastic and on the back of this book it says that this is the novel that sparked the philippine revolution and i think that's quite a useful thing to know about this book and um, because i think that kind of prepares you for what this book is about this novel begins with a young man coming home to the philippines after having been educated abroad and he comes home to discover that his father is dead and that his father died in prison after having been unjustly accused of a crime and he also returns home to find that a friar who he once considered a friend of his father's now will not speak to him will have nothing to do with him has entirely disowned his father and as well as being appalled by this situation he is also appalled by the kind of social and economic situation that he finds in the philippines how many people are living in poverty and within cruel treatment um, and how much the spanish friars and the kind of spanish imperial presence is impacting the people of the philippines this is a book that feels in the tradition of those kind of like um french social critique revolutionary novels like les miserables like the canton monte cristo um and i feel like if you like those two books you will absolutely love this um and i just thought this was an incredibly fantastic book the characterization is amazing the plotting is amazing the social critique um and the look at kind of imperialism and colonialism and the way that those things are kind of being implemented through the church like that is fascinatingly done and so interestingly drawn I just absolutely love this. I will say that this isn't a fast read. Um, like it's only about 400 pages, but it took me quite a long time to read because it was quite dense. Um, and because I didn't know that much about the history of the Philippines. So I was kind of stopping and looking things up a little bit more than I always do when I read classics. But I just found this absolutely incredible and I thought it was so good. You know, like I said, probably my favorite classic of the year so far, or definitely one of my favorite classics of the year so far. Just a truly incredible, powerful impactful novel that was just such like an amazing experience to read so i really really recommend this um and yes so glad that i finally read this i thought it was fantastic and i should have said this edition was translated from the original spanish by harold ogen braun and then i also read a couple of agatha christie books in september both of which i listened to on audiobook with my husband nick we often listen to audiobooks together when we're traveling or driving um somewhere and um, we have been working our way through Poirot in order. So in September, we listened to Death on the Nile by Agatha Christie, which is a Hercule Poirot novel. And Death on the Nile is a really, really fantastic murder mystery. Like I can absolutely see why it is one of Agatha Christie's most famous ones. And I thought it was amazing and um, we both thought it was just such a fantastic mystery and so well done so hercule poirot ends up on a boat going down the nile he's meant to be on holiday but um he can sense that there is lots of tension bubbling specifically surrounding um a recently married couple and um the former fiance of the husband of that couple who has come along and followed them on holiday in order to make their honeymoon rubbish. The wife of the newly married couple is very, very wealthy and there are several other people who may not like her because of her extreme wealth. So there's a lot of tension on this boat and Hercule Poirot knows that something bad is going to happen and you know, everything goes on from there. It's an Agatha Christie, you can expect there to be a murder. Um, I just thought Death on the Nile was really, really good. Like it's a fantastic murder mystery, really, really interesting characterization, great like psychology and really interesting moments and clever scenes. It is really, really worth your time. It is worth being aware that there are definitely some like uncomfortable passages, especially earlier on in the novel. The depiction of Egyptian people isn't great, but that is quite a minor part of the novel. And um, so it's not like really in your face the whole time. There's just a few paragraphs here and there, which, you know, um, reflect very 1930s attitudes and aren't great. Um, so that's kind of worth being aware of, but 
it's not a major part of the novel and as we said in general it is a really fantastic mystery. And then we also listened to um, And Then There Were None on audiobook so I didn't actually read this physical edition but I thought I would hold it up because it's very nice. So we listened to the audiobook narrated by Dan Stevens which was really really fantastic. It was a wonderful audiobook. So I had read And Then There Were None before but Nick hadn't um, and we listened to it while we were on a long drive um, and I just really enjoyed rereading this one and it is one of those books that is just really satisfying to reread once you know the solution and the truth behind everything um, and also I just genuinely think it is possibly Agatha Christie's best book. I think of all the Agatha Christie I've read so far and I've now read quite a lot and then there were none is still my favourite and I still think it is the most like impactful, powerful, sinister, creepy novel and it is very much like a thriller as well as a mystery. It's definitely not cosy in the way that some Agatha Christie's are. It is deeply chilling. So And Then There Were None, um, if you don't know the premise, um, is about 10 people who are all summoned to this island, but they're all actually summoned there under false pretenses. They've been given various reasons for why they should come to this island, but when they get to this island they actually discover that they have all been brought there because all 10 of them have in the past been responsible for the death of someone else in a way that is not punishable under law. So they've basically been brought here to be picked off one by one because of their crimes. Um, and everything goes on from there. It is very tense, very dramatic, the characterization is amazing, and I feel like Agatha Christie just wonderfully creates lots of horrible people, um, like in such a powerful, powerful way. It is not a pleasant book but it is so good um, and it's just exceptionally well done. So I really do recommend And Then There Were None. I do think it is Agatha Christie's best um, and yeah, such a fantastic book. So those are the classics that I read in September um, but to move on to the modern literature, um, this month I also read The Fraud by Zadie Smith. This was the pick for my historical fiction book club that I run over on Patreon um, and this was a really interesting one to read for the book club because I feel like um, there are a lot of very interesting themes and I also feel like some of us really liked it and some of us really didn't like it. Um, and I actually really really liked it. I went into this with quite a lot of trepidation because I have read two books by Zadie Smith before on beauty and white teeth and it wasn't that I hated either of them but both of them I felt were too literary for me. I felt like the ending didn't quite like hang together or give me satisfaction or they're a bit unfocused maybe, I don't know. I didn't really get on with either of them that well. So I was kind of uncertain how I might feel about The Fraud by Zadie Smith, but I knew it was set in the Victorian period and I knew that it partly focused on the Titchbourne case, which is a very famous fraud case um, from the Victorian period where somebody claimed to be the kind of heir to a baronetcy in an estate. I feel like if I think about it objectively, the things I struggled with in the previous Zadie Smith books I've read are all the case in this book as well but for some reason in this book I just didn't care at all. I say for some reason, it's because it was about the Victorian period, um, but Anyway, let me explain what this book is about. So this book mostly focuses on a woman called Eliza Touche and she is more or less the housekeeper to her cousin William Harrison Ainsworth. He's a real historical figure, a Victorian novelist, and William's new much younger wife um, is really interested in the Titchbourne case and Eliza kind of gets interested in the Titchbourne case through Sarah um, and ends up going along to the kind of court hearings um, and there she ends up um, becoming really interested in and meeting a man called Mr Boggle and Mr Boggle is a Jamaican man, a former slave um, and part of this novel ends up kind of being Mr Boggle's story as well. So basically this book is split into like eight volumes and volume one to five are like all about Eliza, then volume six and like most of volume seven are about Mr Boggle and then the kind of end of volume seven and all of volume eight kind of go back to Eliza. Um, and I think that is kind of a useful thing to know before going into it even though that happens quite late on because it does feel like a slightly odd plot structure. And also I think if you read the premise um, and the back of the book, there's quite a lot about like um, Andrew Boggle um, and the history of Jamaica, which like is not as present in the first like two thirds of the novel and then becomes kind of more important later on. And there is a bit of me that does wonder like how this novel would have read if it had been alternating chapters between Eliza and Mr Boggle. But at the same time I also thought there was like an interesting symbolic significance of burying Mr Boggle's narrative within Eliza's um, in the sense that like there is always a kind of imperial legacy and an imperial story like behind the Victorian Britain story if that makes sense. You cannot tell the story of the Victorian period without 
talking about empire but actually the way we talk about the victorian period often empire is hidden um, and kind of underneath the surface so actually we get mr boggle's narrative like embedded within eliza's um in a way that i kind of thought was making an interesting point. And this novel is in part about empire and the kind of hypocrisy of the Victorian period in relation to empire, but it's also about the hypocrisy of the Victorian period in relation to a lot of other things. And in some ways it is an unfocused novel um, and its plot kind of goes in lots of nebulous directions and the ending doesn't necessarily like feel like an ending. But at the same time, I just absolutely loved it because it just picked apart Victorian society and like, the hypocrisies of Victorian society in such fantastic ways um, and it felt so believable and the characters felt so true to the Victorian period but also so like interesting to read about and I just really really loved it. Um, so yes I'm really pleased that I read this um, and I thought it was really great. I feel like it is one that you will get a lot more out of if you are really like interested in Victorian history. And then I also read one work for younger readers this month. I read The Twelve by Liz Hyder. This is coming out in October this year so I had an early copy here um, and this was such a true pleasure to read. So I've been lucky enough to work on some of Liz's adult books editorially in the past um, but this is one of her books for younger readers um, and this is just truly amazing as all of Liz Hyder's books always are. This novel is about a young teenage girl um, who is on holiday with her family for Christmas and um, when her sister vanishes but she doesn't just vanish um no one can remember that her sister ever existed except for our main character and one other teenage boy um who lives in the neighborhood they end up teaming up to try and find out um why Libby has disappeared and what exactly happened to her and it gets kind of involved in various um magical mythological things and it is just excellent I feel like this book is one of those books that both like really feels like a children's classic but also has this like modern edge and um, message to it. And I just thought it worked really, really well. And the two main characters, Kit and Story, were just so well drawn and their dynamic and their relationship and its progression was just amazing. Um, so I just love this a lot. I would really, really recommend it for younger and older readers. Um, it's just a fantastic novel and yeah, such a pleasure to read. And then as I said earlier on in this video, um, I was like half trying to take part in Shorty September in September. Um, so I read that Arthur Conan Doyle short story, but then I also read two other pretty short books. Um, so one thing that I read was this. This is Monumenta by Lara Hayworth. Um, so this is a short literary novel set in Belgrade. It is very weird, um, but I kind of enjoyed it. So this book is about a woman called Olga um, and her house is being requisitioned by the government to be used as a site of a monument to a massacre but there is some debate about which massacre this monument will be a monument to and we're kind of following Olga and her family and various architects who come to like present visions to Olga and the government um, and it's quite a weird surreal book sort of odd strange um, surreal things start happening um, and the characters are all quite weird but it kind of worked. Probably one you're going to love more if you love literary fiction more but I did find it a really interesting read. And then finally the other short thing I read for Shorty September was a comic um, and that was this. This is Hot Girl Once Upon a Galaxy written by Jadzia Axelrod um, with art by Amon Kai Nehal Pan um, and this was just really really fun. Um, so some background to why I was reading a Hot Girl comic. Um, I don't think I've ever spoken about comics before on this channel. I don't think I've ever read a comic before in my life. Over the last year or so Nick and I have been watching um, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, um, the cartoon series from the 2000s um, and I just absolutely love them. They are like genuinely just absolutely fantastic TV, really really great storylines, really really great characterization and great character arcs um, and through watching those series I really fell in love with the character of Hawk Girl um, and Hawk Girl is now like one of my favourite superheroes um, and this Hawk Girl is not actually the same Hawk Girl as in um, those series um, but I just really like Hawk Girl as a character and um, so I wanted to kind of read some Hawk Girl comics um, and this was just such fun I had such a lovely time with this um, so this is about the superhero Hawk Girl um, and um, she kind of teams up with another superhero called Galaxy um, to tackle someone who is 
going back in time and changing the past and kind of using that to fuel her own power um and it's just really really cool i'm trying to find some like cool art to show you um because in general i just think it looks incredible and it was just um massive massive fun um to read as i said i think this is the first comic i've ever read and i feel like i need to read comics a lot more because i just had such a wonderful wonderful time with this and also it was really nice because i'm really kind of into superhero stuff um but most of my like superhero consumption tends to be either like you know the mainstream hollywood films or cartoons from the 90s and 2000s um and actually reading a comic from like last year this hawk girl comic nearly all the characters are women there's a ton of queer representation um, and it was much more like modern um than most of the other superhero stuff that i can see so that was really nice as well and also i just had such a great time with the story and the characters um, and it was really well done and like quite psychologically dark but also really fun um and i just really like hot girl so those are the things that i read in september i didn't actually get as much read in september as i wanted to just because um september was a very very busy month work-wise so i read like more than half of those things when i was on holiday in the first week of september and then i basically didn't read much else except for the fraud for the rest of the month but that is fine i will hopefully get a lot more read in october um but do let me know down in the comments have you read any of these books what did you think of them what was your favorite thing that you read in the month of september and otherwise thanks very much for watching and i'll be back very soon with another bookish video